That's just kind of how it goes there, right? We are in week two of our series, The Counselor, where we're looking at some compelling questions that Jesus asked during the course of his ministry, recognizing that, that like any good counselor, oftentimes the answers that we're looking for are on the other side of a, of a question. It's been said that good leaders ask great questions, but great leaders ask the right questions. And no one was better. No one was better at asking the right question than Jesus Christ. But I wanted to kind of bring some context to the story today because it's, it's similar to last week's story. Last week, the question was, why are you afraid? And the context was Jesus and his disciples in the boat when the sudden storm came upon them. And, and so, again, it was one of those things that it almost sounded like a stupid question, really. It's almost like an insulting question. They're in the midst of a storm, and Jesus said, why are you afraid? It's kind of a similar situation this morning. And so uh, I want to go ahead. This is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Okay, can, can we pause here just for a moment? Is it just me, or does that seem like poor planning? I don't know who the architect was that, that thought it would be a good idea to put a sheep gate by a pool. Am I the only one that thinks that's kind of odd? I, I think I'm going to take a hard pass on going anywhere near, near that pool, right? Now, we, 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 don't know, we don't know exactly what the situation was, but we do know this. We know that this wasn't just a regular pool. John tells us in the very next verse that this pool of water was special, or they thought to have special uh, 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 remedies in it. In verse 3, John 5, verse 3, here a number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. And from time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters, and the first one into the pool after each such disturbance would be cured of whatever disease they had. So every now and then, the, the water in this pool by the sheep gate would just miraculously begin to, to stir and swell up. And whoever got into the pool first, according to tradition, would be healed. And we're not told how often this happened. You know, they might be waiting hours. It might be days. It might be weeks. It might be months. From the context of the story, we can assume that, you know, sometimes they would be waiting a long, long time. But whenever the waters began to stir, as you can imagine, there was this free-for-all by all these lame, sick, and crippled people to try to make it into the pool first. And then in verse 5, John 5, one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. Everyone say 38 years. Verse 6, when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? And here's our question, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was the Sabbath, which kind of is for another sermon. But do you want to get well? That's our question this morning. Do you want to get, well, now on the surface, that seems like an insulting question to someone who's been crippled, an invalid for 38 years, doesn't it? Doesn't that sound like an insulting question? That's like, that's like asking the beggar at that busy intersection up in the city holding the cardboard sign. That's like asking them, hey, you want a $100 bill? That's like asking the, the, the starving person, hey, you want to go to Golden Corral? That's like uh, my wife asking me, hey, you want to fool around? She's not here, so I can say that, but I just, I, just, I just realized she's probably watching, so sorry, honey. But look closely, look closely at his response to Jesus' question in verse 7. Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, somebody else goes down ahead of me. Now, question, did he answer Jesus' question? No. He didn't answer Jesus' question. At our growth group uh, each week, each Wednesday, we're doing season two of The Chosen um, and uh, doing a Bible study with that, with uh, coinciding with season two of The Chosen. And uh, this last week, this coincidence happened to be on this story. Season two, episode four, 
if you haven't seen it, I would highly recommend it because they did an excellent, they did an amazing job of bringing out the human emotion of this particular story, this, this conversation that Jesus had with this, this invalid for 38 years. Instead of answering Jesus' question, the guy starts making excuses, telling Jesus why he's still the way he is, why he's stuck in his crippled condition, which shows us that he was looking to the water for his healing. We know that because of his response. He, he saw the magic water as his ticket to healing. And Jesus was trying to get him to look to him. Verse 8, John chapter 5. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Verse 9, at once, at once, the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. A moment in the presence of Jesus changed everything for that man. So today I want to talk to you about some problems uh, that, I'm talking about persisting problems, problems that we can't seem to shake, ongoing persistent problems that we just kind of seem to get stuck in. For 38 years, for 38 years, this man was an invalid. And a moment in the presence of Jesus changed everything. And I believe Jesus can do the same thing for you and for me. So I see at least three significant challenges for problems that persist and perhaps maybe you can relate to some of these. The first one is this right here. The longer a problem persists, the more discouraged you become. Hello? Isn't that true? The longer you're wrestling with something, the more discouraged that you get. And see, this was another, this was another part in that episode of The Chosen that really pulled this out in a very powerful way as it showed these, these snapshots of time and time and time again. This invalid, every time those waters would stir, it showed him trying to get down to that water. And each scene, it showed him getting older and older and older. They showed his face. And each scene, you could see him getting more defeated and beat down and beat down and discouraged. Some of you might be experiencing your own relentless problems that just won't go away. Might be a relationship, might be a marriage, might be a physical problem that's left you with some chronic pain. It might be a career choice that you're having second thoughts about now, but you don't know what to do. You're stuck. It might be an addiction that you can't seem to, to shake. The point being, the longer a problem persists, the more excuses you tend to make. And that's the second part here. The longer a problem persists, the more excuses you tend to make. You start making excuses because ultimately it's going to make you feel better if you put blame somewhere else. Hello? Amen. We make excuses because ultimately it's going to make us feel better if we don't have to own it. And that's what this guy does. He says, Jesus, I have no one to help me get into the water. When I try to go there, I can't walk. And they all run by me. They crawl over me. And I'm just left there completely helpless and hopeless. No one can help me. And look, I don't want to be hard on this guy. After all, I've never been an invalid. I've never had to deal with the challenges of, uh, and, and restrictions of, of not being able to walk. At the same time, in spite of what he couldn't do, I'm thinking that there were some things that he could have done. To get into, I mean, you think about it. If he honestly felt like, you know, his ticket to, to healing, if he, only, if he honestly felt like it was in the water, I'd figure out some way to get there. Crawl, you know, scoot, do the inchworm, you know, do, whatever it takes. I'm going to figure out a way to get in there. How bad do you want that? How bad do you want that healing? Here's my point. It makes you wonder if all those years of waiting, all those times when someone else beat him down to the water, I wonder if that eventually took its toll on him mentally, mentally, to the point that he resigned himself to, you know, it is what it is. I don't like it. You know, I wish I wasn't here, but no one's going to help me. I can't do anything about it. Proverbs 13, 12, Solomon says, it is sad not to get what you hope for, but wishes that come true are like eating fruit from the tree of life. But here's how the message puts it. Unrelenting disappointment leaves you heart sick. But a sudden good break can turn your life around. Some of you are experiencing unrelenting disappointment in your, in your life, maybe in your marriage. You don't know how you got there. It didn't happen overnight, but you've just resigned yourself. You know, it is what it is, you know. And, and, and to limit the collateral damage, well, well, we'll wait till the kids are older and then we'll do something about it. We tried. 
Yeah, we, we, we went to counseling, right? But it didn't do any good, which <laughs> kind of amuses me when people say, yeah, we went to church once. Really? And it didn't help? <laughs> One time we even went two weeks in a row. I'm being a little facetious here, but this, is, this isn't about, you know, the, the secret sauce isn't in coming into this building. It's in, it's in a relationship with Jesus. I've tried everything, and just things just don't seem to get any better. Maybe it's a health issue you've been struggling with for years, and you've seen doctor after doctor after doctor, and no one seems to be able to, to, to help you or give you any answers, you know, so it is what it is. I mean, I don't like it, but this is my lot in life, I guess. Just being very honest, and, 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 I, and I hesitate to share this because I don't want to give, paint a picture of, of defeat because we, she, my wife, hasn't given up, and we have seen some improvement in her, her physical condition that she's had for a while now. But you know what? We're still asking. We're still seeking. We're still knocking. And along the way, we have seen some, some miracles, but we, we have definitely seen the grace of God through this journey. The, the point is, I don't want you to get so discouraged that you say, you know what? I guess this is what God has for me. I guarantee you, if you're hurting, that's not what God has for you. Keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. Maybe it's your career. Maybe you're at a place where you're having regrets over your career choice or, or you have limited options because you don't have a college degree or you don't have the qualifications at your work to advance to get that promotion. And so you feel kind of stuck. Yeah, this is as good as it's going to get. The longer a problem persists, the more discouraged you become. The longer a problem persists, the more excuses you make. And then the third thing is, the longer a problem exists, the more you tend to compensate. The longer we're wrestling with something, the more we tend to compensate for that problem. <clears throat> this past Wednesday morning, we, we have, uh, the, the guys have a Bible study uh, every uh, Wednesday morning. Uh, lately, we've been going through the book of Revelation, so you know we're, we're going to be really dangerous by the time we finish that Bible study. But anyway, um, after, after our, our study this past week, I was talking to Monty, Monty Rogers, and, and uh, if you don't know Monty, Monty and his wife Angie have been coming to family church for, for a while now. Monty grew up in, in Iola, Kansas, and <clears throat> being a person of color, <clears throat> Monty said he never really had a lot of confidence and assurance growing up in that rural <laughs> Kansas small town. In fact, he said there were times he felt he really did feel less than than others. So to compensate, so to compensate, he he said he went almost to the opposite extreme. He said he just became very arrogant, uh, even even cocky. That was the word. He said he even became cocky throughout his middle and high school uh, years. But because he was going to church at the time, because he said. His mom, his mom and dad dragged him to church, you know, so, but he, he was still going to church. And because he was going to church, so he knew that this was a mask. He knew that wasn't who he really was. He knew that cockiness and arrogance, that that was, that that was a front. But as he continued to carry that from, from his uh, middle and high school years into adulthood, he, he continued to compensate for that, those feelings of inadequacy by that arrogant attitude, so much so that after he attained a great level of financial success, he attributed that success to him. Look what I do. You know, look, this is my business savvy. You know, this is my own doing. This is my own networking. But for Monty, you know, he's, he said that the, the thing that kind of started triggering the, this question, the, the, the time when he heard the question from Jesus, do you want to be well? was when his marriage fell apart and he went through a divorce. Because he said that's when he first started to see the large picture of life and where God might fit into his success story. His story, period, but especially his success story. Through divinely orchestrated events, God brought Angie into his life and they got married and then God brought them here. And Monty will tell you, and you should ask him this because he loves telling this story, but Monty will tell you that once he surrendered his heart and his life to Jesus and he got this eternal perspective on his success and how God blessed him so that he could be a blessing to others. And, and today, Monty and Angie are some of the best givers to family church. But the really cool thing is to this day, Monty still tells me that, that he gets more satisfaction, more fulfillment 
out of coming and serving at family church than he gives back to the church. He still feels like, I can't give enough, and which surprised me because I know how much he gives. But he said, no, 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 I, I still feel like I can't give enough. In fact, he said of all the businesses he's bought and sold and all the positions that he's held in, in, in the business world, he said, you'll, you'll love this. He said the one that he's loved the most is the job that he does here every Sunday morning, standing out there, hugging your neck, smiling at you and greeting you. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? In fact, he said he's on a mission to replace Kyle. <laughs> he wants to take Kyle's position. But he's got to work on his names because he can't remember names. And of course, Kyle's the king of remembering names. But for some of you, your compensation isn't for a low self-esteem. Your compensation is for something more life-controlling. Statistics tell us that even among this relatively small group of people this morning, that there are some here who are struggling with pornography. And you tell yourself it doesn't really matter that much. And, and you know, you've, you've learned to erase the traps to pick up the breadcrumbs so no one can track you and follow you, right? In fact, you've gotten really good at not getting caught. And besides, it's not hurting anyone. At least that's what you tell yourself. It's not hurting anyone. Can I tell you, you're just compensating? Because here's the truth. Porn does hurt. Porn does hurt. Statistics tell us the divorce rate doubles in marriages where one of the spouses is caught up in pornography. So I'm sorry, ma'am. I'm sorry, sir. It does hurt other people. Some of you have learned to compensate for a tragic loss in your life. You've gotten stuck in your grief, and it's taking its toll on you. The enemy has lied to you, and, and, and you feel guilty about even trying to, to, to start feeling happy again. So, so, you, so you become content living in a state of grief that has become your new normal. And you don't like it, but you don't see any way out of it. I was talking to uh, Debbie McCullough earlier this week, and her and Mandy help lead our grief share uh, ministry that meets on Mondays here at the church. And I told her, I said, you know, I feel like two of the, two of the most underutilized ministries that we have here at Family Church are the grief share and the Celebrate Recovery. Because I know, I know there are a whole lot more people who would benefit from coming to those than, than are attending In talking with Debbie, she said something that jumped out at me. She said, people grieving sometimes feel guilty about trying to be happy again, which is why so many people end up stuck in their grief. And I said, can I use that? Because that is an appropriate word. You're stuck. You feel stuck. And look, I'm not saying that you ever fully get past that huge hole that's been left in your life. But you cannot stay stuck in your grief. God's got something more for you. But people are scared. We talked about that. People are scared. They don't know what to expect. But if that's you, I would encourage you to talk to Debbie. Go to our website. Look it up and kind of talk about what they do. I guarantee you it'll help you out. And I know that that helps her and Mandy keep unstuck. Because otherwise they would. It's hard. It's hard but Jesus does have a way out for you. In fact, it's through grief share that God has turned Debbie's and Mandy's misery into ministry. Statistics also tell us that there are some highly functioning alcoholics here among us. Sure, it puts a stress on your marriage. Sure, it's a challenge for your children. But professionally, you're highly functioning. If people don't know, and if they don't know, they don't really care because thus far, you've figured out how to manage the consequences. Chances are, if you've uh, been coming here for very long, probably one of the first people to hug your neck or greet you when you started coming here was Mike Holtwick. <laughs> is that you, Mike? <clears throat> Mike is also the leader of our CR ministry. And, and most, as most of you know, Mike is a recovering alcoholic. In fact, he'll tell you that he wasn't just an alcoholic. He was a highly functioning alcoholic. In other words, he took care of his responsibilities. He, he, he wasn't going to be a deadbeat. No, no, no. He wasn't going to be a deadbeat father or husband. No, no, no. He made sure he took care of his... But still, he longed for that date with the beer or with the drink each day. 
He would orchestrate, he'll tell you, he would schedule his day around that date. So he was highly functioning. Right? I asked him this past week when he first started drinking, he said he was 17. I said, well, when did you quit drinking? He said he was 53. Now, that's not 38 years like this invalid, but it's close. It's 36. And even though he wasn't an alcoholic when he first started drinking, that's what it led to. That's what he eventually became. So Mike was on his own 36-year journey of settling for so much less than what God had for him. Why? Because you can't change what you're willing to tolerate. Someone should tweet that. You can't change what you're willing to tolerate. Mike tolerated alcohol for 36 years, but then Jesus showed up one day and said, Mike, do you want to be well? And he said, yes, Jesus, I do. And now what used to be Mike's misery has become Mike's ministry. That's how good our Jesus is. See, Jesus' question, it wasn't an insult at all. It was a valid question. Because 38 years of futility had conditioned this guy to settle for so much less than what God had for him. Why did Jesus ask this guy, do you really want to be well? Because you can't help someone who needs help. You can only help someone who wants help. Which leads us to the big idea for this morning's message. Jesus doesn't want to hear our excuses. He wants to see our faith. See, in my mind, one of the biggest hindrances to faith, it's not worry, it's not doubt, it's the familiar. It's the mindset of this invalid that, that was just, you don't understand. I've been like this for 38 years. Why should I expect anything to change now? I've tried everything. I mean, I don't like it, but I've learned to get by. I've learned to compensate. Can I tell you, dear ones, Jesus didn't die for you so you could just Get by. He has so much more for you. So much more for you. If years of frustration and disappointment have you stuck at a place of hopelessness and futility, you need to know that you don't have to stay there. The problem isn't on God's end. Until your desire becomes bigger than your disability, then you're never going to experience that abundant life. Until your desire becomes greater than your disability, you'll never be able to walk into that abundant life and healing that Jesus offers you. You need to think about that. Do you really want to get out of debt? Then do something. Get a plan. Go to Dave Ramsey Financial Peace University that we've offered. Do you really want to lose weight? Then do something. Start exercising, right? Start eating better. Quit eating that bowl of bluebell ice cream a half hour before you go to bed every night. Do you really want a better job? Put a resume together. Start sending feelers out. Do you really want to be set free from an addiction? Do something about it. Start, start, start attending a CR class. Which brings us back to our question. Do you really want to be well? Because you can't help someone who just needs help. You can only help someone who wants help. And you can't change what you're willing to tolerate. And until your desire becomes bigger than your disability, then you're not going to find healing. So Jesus asked a question, do you want to be well? The guy answered, I have no one to help me out. And when, in, in, in the, the chosen episode, it, this is really the powerful part. Jesus says, I didn't ask you that. I didn't ask you about, you know, who's not helping you. No, no, no. And, and, and that's the powerful part of it. And I never saw this story in that light before, this tough love of Jesus. But that's exactly what this guy needed. That? Great leaders ask the right questions. And Jesus looks at this guy, says, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And Jesus miraculously heals the guy. But I want you to note three things real quick. Number one, the sick guy didn't even ask to be healed, did he? He didn't ask to be healed. Think about that. Jesus did for this guy what this guy didn't even ask Jesus to do. See, when you get close to Jesus, and here's the point, when you get close to Jesus, he'll do things for you that you didn't even ask him to. guy didn't even ask to be healed. Number two, he did nothing to earn it or deserve it. This guy did nothing to earn or deserve this healing. Jesus didn't heal this man because he was good. Jesus healed the man because Jesus was good. It's called grace. It's called grace. 
And number three, the healing didn't happen in the way that he thought it would. See, in this guy's mind, his healing was going to come through that pool of water. If I can just get in the water, I'll be healed. But that's not how the healing came. Some of you have been searching for healing in a certain particular way or in a certain category. Maybe because God did it that way before or you saw God do that with with someone else. And so in your mind, you're thinking that's how it's going to come. Be careful. Be careful. Because if you're so locked in on thinking that your healing or provision is going to come a certain way, if if God wants to do it a different way, you're not going to see it when it comes. You're not going to see it. And don't, don't forget who we're talking about here. Let's allow God to be God. We're talking about God, the big guy, the one who has Genesis chapter 1 on his resume, the one who spoke and everything came in. That's who we're talking about here. So people, he can do whatever he wants, however he wants. So allow God to be God in those situations. I don't know who needs to hear this, but someone needs to know that sometimes God does things in ways we never expected. So we need to allow God to be God. It's like the person who's in financial trouble kept buying lottery tickets. As your pastor, I can't believe I need to say this, but can I tell you that your your, your financial windfall is probably not going to come through the lottery? But if it does, don't forget the 10% tithe on that. (laughs) Or like the person who wanted to lose weight, so they enrolled in Nutrisystems, because after all, it says you can eat anything, (laughs) Right? So, you know, they were on a plan to, uh, to lose 25 pounds, right? And six weeks later, they only had 32 more to go. <laughs> now, can God use those programs? Absolutely. But he might have a different plan than you envision. That's the power of our good God. Jesus says to this guy, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. In other words, if you're taking notes, Jesus essentially said, I don't want to hear your excuses. That's what he's saying. Listen to Jesus say, I don't want to hear your excuses. Don't tell me what you can't do and what you're not able to do and what other people won't do for you. I just want you to stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. You do what you can do, and let me do what I do. That's what Jesus told this guy. I'm going to touch you. I'm going to heal you, but I want to see your faith to do what for 38 years you've been unable or unwilling to do. I want you to have the courage and the faith to step away from the familiar because the familiar is often the greatest hindrance to faith. And you're going to have to have faith to stand up when you think that your legs aren't going to be capable of supporting you. You've got to have that faith. And I've been praying all week that someone's going to take a step of faith today and trust God to help you overcome a problem that you gave up on years ago. And I don't know what this looks like for you, You know, you may drop your pack of cigarettes in the trash on the way out. You you may start attending Grief Share tomorrow or CR, Celebrate Recovery, on Thursday. I don't know what that's going to look like for you, but here's what I know, and here's what you need to know. It's going to require a step of faith from you. I know that. I know that. Because if this was something that you could already deal with, you would have done it. You're smart people. If this was something you could make a small little tweak to and you'd be past it, You would have already done it, right? Right? But you're still stuck there. So obviously you do need some some help. Do you want to be made well? Because God isn't just going to help someone who needs help. He's going to help those who want help. So you do what only you can do and trust God to do what only he can do. It takes faith to leave the familiar. He wants to help. But you cannot change, listen to me, dear ones, you cannot change what you're willing to tolerate. Amen? Bow your heads, let me pray for you. Father, I pray that the power of your Holy Spirit, that same power that you used to heal that invalid years ago, would would, would set people free this morning. God, I pray that by your power that you would do miracles just like you did in Monty's life and in Mike's life and in so many other people gathered here this morning in our lives, Father. People who are just willing to take that step of faith and trust you. God, we know that you're going to do a work, but we also know that you don't want to hear our excuses. You want to see our faith. And so I pray, God, that we would take appropriate steps of faith as you lead us. 
and that you would be pleased by our faith and honor our faith and that hope would be restored and healing would begin. Help us to see. Help us to see that, Lord, that question, do you want to be well? That it actually applies to all of us. Because without Christ, we're all sick. It's called sin. It's called sin. And our sin keeps us from God. And in a moment of honesty, some of you here this morning would admit that you've done something, something you regret, something you wish you could undo. And sometimes you wonder if if God would even let you come to him after all that you've done. Can I tell you that the answer is yes? The answer is yes. Do you want his forgiveness? Do you want his grace? Do you want to be well? And some of you here this morning, you know you're here for this moment. It's time to say yes to him. Do you want to be well and surrender your life to Christ? If that's you, it would be my honor to lead you in a prayer. If you would just pray this after me, say, Father, Heavenly Father, I, I surrender my life to you. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. I confess that, that I am a sinner. I pray that you would forgive me for my sins, all those things that I've done that have separated me from you and your plan and purpose for my life. And right now, I choose to give my life to you. My life is not my own. I give it to you, and I take your life in return. Fill me with your spirit so I can serve you for the rest of my life. Thank you for this new life in Jesus. And I give you mine now. In Jesus' name.